Ladies and gentlemen, we are back for another glorious edition of Ask That. My name is Clark Sell, and today is a day about talking about our favorite subject, documents. And we're not talking legal, we're talking developer. My name is Clark Sell. This is another version of Ask That. And with me today, I have Scott Addy. Scott, how are you, sir? Doing well, Clark. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. And uh, for everybody who's maybe seen a few links pop through in the last uh, hours, we've tried to get this thing booted. We've had a few technical difficulties. Um, and there doesn't seem to be any documentation on how to fix it. So such is life, I guess, right? <laughs> if only I knew someone that could help you with that. That's right. So, hey, uh, before we get started on this conversation, why don't you tell everybody who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name's Scott Addy. I'm a member of the docs.microsoft.com team um, at Microsoft. Uh, my focus there is specifically the ASP.NET Core um, documentation. Uh, believe it or not, there's around three of us, three or four, that work on that content uh, full time. Um, so we're scarce resources. Um, I transitioned into this role from enterprise development, and I was doing that for about 12 years, uh, primarily in the financial services industry. And, uh, you know, doing primarily forms over data kind of work, enterprise line of business apps, got burnt out. From there, went into trying things like public speaking and found out that it's scary as hell, but I actually enjoy it. Uh, as crazy as that sounds, yep. and then started doing a little bit of writing on the side as well, and that eventually um, got me into what I do now uh, for my day job. Uh, and I, I don't know if I caught it. Your day job is where? Oh, you said you were on the, the docs team for ASP.NET. Yep. Um, yeah, for anybody who's watching, we've frozen, but we're rolling with this, so a uh, maybe a better audio experience than a video one, but such is life. Um Yes, yeah, so that's an interesting um, kind of a tenure, if you will, um, going from enterprise development to to now writing docs. Have you always considered yourself to be a, a bit of a writer? No, and in fact, you know, if you would have asked me just a couple of years ago, how would you like to write docs as a job? I would have told you you're nuts. That sounds boring. Um, yeah, I never really considered myself much of a writer, although I will say, you know, going through school, um, English was one of my favorite courses. And I always told myself, you know, I wouldn't mind doing something in that, but at the same time, it wouldn't pay the bills. Yeah. Did you write a lot of docs as a developer? No. So, um, you know, I'd, I, you know, I'm guilty of it. Uh, I'd write plenty of code uh, in my jobs and rarely document any of it, um, as most of us do, unfortunately. Um, where I kind of got my foot in the door was, um, you know, I was working at my last job, started contributing to uh, the GitHub repo for the ASP.NET Core docs, and it got to the point where I was one of the top contributors in that repo that wasn't already working on the team. And so it was sort of a natural transition to just, you know, accept that job when it became available. Um, it was something that I was doing completely in my free time, but I found that for some strange reason, I enjoyed doing it. Um, maybe that was because I, I saw the impact. I was helping developers all over the world unblock themselves with problems they were encountering. Sure, sure. So I'm I'm kind of inferring here, guessing, but I'm I'm guessing you started contributing back to those docs, found something that just needed to be fixed, and fixed it, and it just kind of rolled from there. Right. So I was uh, this was back in the beta days of ASP.NET Core that I was contributing, and uh, you know I was just playing around with it in my free time, and I you know as I was learning stuff, I'd find you know, either gaps in the docs, you know, information that was completely missing, or, you know, I'd find typos or um, even some content that was, you know, completely inaccurate. And those were the types of things I would go in and update. So let's let's talk about docs for a second, because I think everybody probably has a love-hate with, with them. I mean, 
how I, I really want to dive into like what makes them good, how can one contribute, mm-hmm. uh, et cetera. But like, does does I guess backing up, does everything need to have documentation, and how do you know when it's the right level of documentation? Yeah, so I think a lot of that, you know, determining what to write, um, part of the, the problem is people will write documentation without ever talking to um, the target audience. Uh, they don't emphasize with who the readers actually are. And so, you know, going out to events, that conference, great example with your open spaces that you have, that's a great opportunity for someone like me who's writing docs or even someone in their day job, you know, producing a readme file. It's a great opportunity to just network with other other developers, figure out what they're struggling with, how they document things, how they learn. Um, You can produce valuable content with information like that. but, you know, another another big part of the process is understanding the technology myself. So the ASP.NET Core team might, you know, release a new feature, and that's great, but now I've got to spend time to understand it myself, talk to the engineers in the product unit so that I can document it accurately, and, you know, break that down into something that, you know, even a beginner-level developer could digest and start to use. So what? So what do you what would you say is the like the primary objective that the document is trying to solve? Um, well, we for, for a lot of the docs we break it down by task um, for the beginners. So we have a series of tutorials. For example, you've never used ASP.NET before. Uh, maybe you want to build a web application. Okay, here's a tutorial that will show you how to do that on Windows, or here's a tutorial that will show you how to do that on Linux or Mac. Um, just to produce, you know, a tutorial will allow you to produce something that you can actually use and build upon um, by reading the other docs. So we try and cater to both beginners um, and to the seasoned developers that have been around using our products for years. And what we find is for those more seasoned developers, it's not tutorials that they're looking for. It's more reference style documents. Um, You know, years ago, developers like that would have, uh, you know, read TechNet articles or MSDN, or they would have gone to Barnes & Noble and picked a book off the shelf. Um, It's these reference documents that are filling that need. What? I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to just think of documents as just kind of the written word. And we know that that's not the case. What kind of supporting artifacts do you really find make a useful set of documents? Um, I think one of the biggest things is a working sample application. Um, so, you know, as a new version of the product is released, we've got to make sure the um, associated sample apps are updated to that version as well. And the challenge there is we've got to have a working sample app for the various versions of the product. Um, So, you know, working code, that's a big thing. We also find that some developers don't like encountering a wall of text. You know, they prefer uh, bite-sized videos that explain a concept. And so, you know, we're experimenting with mixing uh, those bite-sized videos with the actual documentation so that we're catering to more than just one style of learning. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, time and place, right? There's there's only so many hours in the day and there's only so many keystrokes. So um, right. walls of texts are nobody, – ain't nobody got time for that. Right. And, I mean, there's strategies there as well. You know, if you've got – a giant paragraph, can that be um, broken down into a couple of bullet points that someone could easily scan with their eyes to pick out, you know, the big points that the article is trying to make? I mean, do you feel like, do you feel like it's a never ending process to keep the documentation kind of relevant and up to date, you know, slash useful or? It really is. Um, And so, with my team in particular, we really lean on the community to help us out uh, because we're not staffed by any means to do it all. Um, you know, our, our focus is on my team, ASP.NET Core and .NET Core. Um, but if you look at, you know, the size of my team, we're at about 10 people. That's it. 
Um, if you look at the number of unique contributors in the community, let's say for ASP.NET Core documentation, well, that's right around 715 unique contributors in the community. So those are people like who I was before I joined Microsoft that were, you know, finding um, gaps in the docs or finding typos in the docs and contributing back. You know, one of my one of my struggles with docs has always been the kind of uh, the pragmatic approach of like this is how you do a thing versus this is why you do a thing, uh, mm -hmm. and and the why, you know, is is always super hard to try to illustrate at times. Yep. Do you find yourself trying to like strike that balance of like teaching people how to do something right versus just how to get something done? Right. I, th I think the how part of it is that's the easy part. The why is where you really need to put yourself in the shoes of that developer and figure out, well, you know, why would they need to use this technique or technology in their day job? And I think it's more important to understand the why before you try and write about the how. how? Sure. Um, except for the how is typically pretty easy to generate, mm -hmm. right? I mean, right. There's there's a lot of docs that are just generated. Um, yeah, it, it, that's a hard one. Yeah, I mean, let's take you know uh, the world of JavaScript for example. <laughs> uh, we all like to pick on that, but you know, let's say a new single page app framework or library falls out of the sky yeah. and that's the shiny object that grab uh, that you know developers want to gravitate towards but the thing that's often missing there is the why are you yeah. taking a serious look at that just because it's shiny and new um, what you should be asking yourself instead is how does that you know solve a problem that i have if at all and that leads you to the why yeah i but now we get into like architecture and everything that comes around that, and and now we're now we're talking about a whole different set of documentation, right? Right. And that's and we a, have guidance on that as well. That there is architectural guidance, and uh, we we publish those in the form of eBooks um, most of the time. But what's but okay? But to that point, though, I mean, what's the exchange between the two there? You know, if you're I think it's pretty easy to say if you're shipping a product or something that somebody is going to consume, then the the writing, and and I've been in product development for many many years, and so that's always a pretty clear cut thing of when do you need to write some docs because you you have a very defined customer. But right. if we go back to like your enterprise days or you know, I don't know whatever. Now that that documentation starts to feel like a bit of a, ta a tax, um, mm -hmm. especially if, you know, said 10 people are only going to be the ones in there. Where is it still good to write, doc to, like spend that time on it? Or is your time better spent like writing unit tests that execute the code and document things in a different way? So that's a great point. I think, you know, if I put myself in the shoes of the enterprise developer, some level of documentation is important. You know, that could just be a simple readme file that explains, you know, here's, you know, the various components of the application. But I think you should focus more of your time in writing good unit tests. Your code should be self-documenting. You onboard a new developer, that developer should be able to just take a look at the unit tests and figure out, you know, what does this app do? How should it behave? Um, I, I, like I said, I really think that's where more focus should be placed um, if you're doing enterprise development. Um, for, for someone like me in my current role, it's kind of flipped. There, yeah, unit tests are still important in yeah. sample apps that I'm producing. However, I'm, I'm focusing more of my time on the actual documentation and explaining the why and the how. Yeah, and, you know, sample apps, you mentioned that earlier, right? They're a good way to see how the system works. I mean, I guess in some some regards you could call that a bit of a unit test in, in itself. Um, 
you know, and as we've been talking about this, and I think back upon my product days, I'm, you know, wouldn't it wouldn't it have been nice if we had thought about some of that stuff differently? And so, in thus, there's a, you know, a um, more of a unit test style approach to uh, the documentation, and and maybe the the written word is focused more on the contextual pieces and. You know the executing code is kind of proving that without the, you know the, you know, nine hundred pound gorilla of, you know the right. sample app and I mean there's times where you you need that that holistic solution but then there's other times where it's like I just need to learn how to create the, I don't know the WebSocket client that does the thing that does the thing. Right, and I you know I think the community has really latched onto this in the past couple of years. We're seeing great projects out there. Swagger, for example, I don't know if you've used you've probably used yeah. it. Uh, just a quick, stupid, easy way to generate a help page for your web API. Um, you know things like that go a very long way, especially in the enterprise and on large teams. Yeah, there there's yeah there's some really great tool. I I can't remember. There was another one that we used to use uh, back in the day, and um, you would get code with like your keys. And in fact, Particle does a pretty good. I think it's Particle. Mm -hmm. They do a pretty good job with that too. You, you got your APIs and um, some of the executing code with your keys and this, that, and the other, so you, just, you can really get a better sense of what it what it really should be and execute. And, um, but again, you know, at the product level, that's super easy to to kind of know that you have to do because you're selling a thing versus in the enterprise where yep. you're not really necessarily selling a thing. Um, yep. You're documenting your own uh, forgetfulness when you want to come back to it. <laughs> when, when do you think it's too much? Um, you know, that's a tough question. I, I think, um, it, one of my goals as a content developer is to try and be as concise as possible. You know, um, are there unnecessary words in this sentence that I'm writing, or we would call that deadwood? Is there any deadwood in this paragraph that I'm writing? To try and get straight to the point. If there are, you know, screenshots you're including that will quickly become outdated when, you know, the next yeah. major version of the product is released, leave those out. Um, as far as, you know, when is it too much? Um, you know, if you're writing a, a doc that takes 25 minutes to, to read, that's probably too much. And in fact, you'll find at the top of a lot of the docs we write, it'll provide an estimated read time. Um, so we do pay close attention to that, recognizing that when people are coming to our docs, there's typically, um, a certain task they're trying to solve with, you know, very little time to figure out how to solve it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, you know, kind of how you got involved. I, I feel like docs are always a great way for anybody to get involved in some open source thing. There's, um, you know, the, the barrier to entry is pretty low. Yep. Um, it's usually a thing that is needed. Um, just because there's not enough hands on or not enough uh, hours in the day or keystrokes, if you will. All right. Um, so what I find in talking to people who want to get involved but haven't got involved, one of the biggest barriers there is uh, GitHub, for example. That's what we're using. Uh, you might hear from these people, well, I don't know anything about Git or GitHub, and quite frankly, that's what scares me from contributing. And so, you know, we've tried to address that in our docs, and we've gotten it to the point now where you can pull up the docs on docs.microsoft.com, find the specific doc you're interested in, and there's going to be an edit link over on the right-hand side of the page. You can click that and do all of your editing right on the web page in GitHub. You know, really no Git knowledge required whatsoever. And, I, you know, the reason why I bring this up is, um, things weren't quite that nice when I started contributing. And I can tell you for a fact, a lack of knowledge of Git and GitHub, that was my biggest barrier. Uh, that's why I didn't start sooner. And when you, when you, I mean, to be concrete about the lack of knowledge, you know, we're really talking about forking a repository, pulling it down, 
making right. changes and then pushing back up the PR to be approved. Yep. Yeah. And that can be intimidating. Um, you know, in your day job, you might be using some completely different source control system, you know, sure. TFS or uh, Subversion, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Are we, do you think we're in a place um, where, well, I'm going to take it a step further. When when do we need to take documentation from, you know, a markdown file to something that's like much more proper and illustrative on a, on a say, a static website or something where it's beyond kind of uh, text and, and images and links? Um, you know, that's actually how we author our docs. It's, it's marked down, um, and it's, it's, you know, translated to the HTML that you see on the page. Sure. Um, that serves most of our needs just fine. You know, it, it, if you couple that with the sample code, it goes a very long way. And then incorporate video for some of the more, um, complicated topics, I would say, something that's a little more difficult to digest. Sure. That's when you need to put a lot more thought into it and maybe Markdown alone won't suffice in that case. Yeah, I don't know. I, it, it's it's always one of those things where you think about kind of pushing the boundaries of people's uh, time and the resources that we have available and um, being able to effectively use it in, in such a way. Right. You know, I can tell you as an enterprise dev, I had resources like Pluralsight available to me, for example. One of my biggest gripes with something like Pluralsight is just, you know, the amount of time you need to invest just to understand some concept. Yeah. Uh, you know, it might take three hours of Pluralsight videos to really understand something. But if I could find that in written form or smaller videos, that would be my preference because again, I'm short on time, you know, deadlines are looming. Um, I need a paycheck. So, you know, again, I'm going to steer clear of those longer videos. Um, taking, since we, we brought up Pluralsight, where do you feel like Twitch plays in today's world? I know a lot of people are doing live coding, um, which I think is interesting. Um, I don't know that I really have time to watch somebody fumble around. Right. Well, you know, so I've uh, started watching some of those over the past couple of months. Uh, Jeff Fritz, for example, has a great Twitch stream that he does for anything ASP.NET Core, and he started to introduce other technologies as well. I think that's a great resource, and um, personally, I'd like to see how we can start to incorporate some of that into the docs. You know, uh, if someone's reading a particular doc and Jeff is doing a stream on that topic, um, say, a week from now, it'd be kind of cool to advertise that in the doc. And then that's a resource where the developer could get their questions answered live by an expert. So really more more of a, I don't know, kind of like we're doing now, a live stream of right. Q&A, focused Q&A, I guess. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because yeah. sometimes you'll find that, you know, the docs don't quite meet your needs in the real world scenario that you're sure. dealing with. Yeah. Um, and that's where the live Q&A would really go a long way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, docs can only go so far in it. And it, certainly this is a an interesting topic for us to just talk about here and ask that. I think it's, it's easy to th throw it to the side. It's easy to say, you know, I need another feature done or whatever. But uh, they, it is about scale, right? I mean, we, we write these things to educate others so that we ultimately don't have to be the one answering that question. Um, right. If, if we could answer all the questions and we would just set up, you know, an hour a week and answer the questions and not mess around with writing the docs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not everybody's in the same position you are. I mean, you guys, you guys have a team of people that are, are working on that. Um, I've been on outside of, my Microsoft days have been on very few who have had, you know, we may have had a dedicated tech writer or two, but you know, that was, that was about it. Right. It, it always fell down to the developer's job. And if you're like me, if it isn't for the red squiggly underneath the word, you don't know if that thing is misspelled or not. <laughs> well, you know, so for people like that, that, you know, 
really struggle with spelling and grammar in general. Um, this is a nice segue into something that the team has recently done. So uh, we recommend using Visual Studio Code for authoring the docs. And the team has actually released um, the extensions that we use internally to produce docs. And those are all made available in the VS Code marketplace under uh, an extension called the Docs Authoring Pack. Um, so that's just a bundle of extensions that would help you with issues like what you just described. Uh, you know, maybe you struggle to spell certain words correctly or you're a beginner to markdown. Um, this is really the place that this extension has. It's, it's to assist you in, in contributing and being successful in that. Well, we will we will certainly link that up um, in the description below uh, because that sounds like a good one. Yeah, another resource that I would throw out there is uh, we actually uh, made our internal writing style guide available um, on GitHub, um, and you could you know as someone in the community you could find that at docs.microsoft.com/style-guide. If you go out there again, that's another great resource. Say you don't know when to use um, a, a semicolon or an apostrophe, or you don't know how to format a heading, or you don't know what to take into account for things like accessibility for people looking at our docs with assistive devices like screen sure. readers. Sure. These are, you know, this is a set of guidelines to take into account. That's a, that is a very good resource for sure. And it goes beyond just contributing to our docs. Say you're, you know, you have an open source project and you want to step up your game with your docs. Use this as a resource to accomplish that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, Scott, at the end of every one of these, I like to extend a bit of gratitude and acknowledge the other person. And with that being said, I'd like to acknowledge you for not just being here today, but for your, your work around um, our little community here in the Midwest. I know that You've uh, you spoke at that conference and uh, made your way around Madison and, and around. And and with that being said, I just want to thank you for the time that you've given back. Um, certainly link those links below. I think it's uh, it'd be neat to share that and see how people use that just in their own day-to-day uh, -day stuff. Well, thank you again, Clark. I really appreciate it. Um, my last question of you today is one that I've started asking everybody in this. Um, and with that being said, I'm curious what your definition of community is. Um, my, I guess my definition of community would be, you know, anyone with a similar interest as yours, it doesn't matter what their background is, what walk of life they come from. Um, community is about just accepting those people for who they are. And not focusing on differences, but focusing on what brought you together in the first place. I love it. I love it. Well, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate you for watching another version of Ask That. I apologize about the video being locked up, but the audio was fantastic. And, well, it just lets you multitask with things. Uh, if you got some docs you like or a site that you think works really well, leave a comment below. Give us a thumbs up. Like us, subscribe, tell the friends. Uh, with that, Scott, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Scott underscore Addy, um, or you can find me um, out on uh, GitHub, and my user ID out there is, again, Scott Addy. Um, take a look at the docs. Um, you can ping me on there as well. Awesome. We will do that. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Scott, thank you for the time today, and we will see you next time.